The clock struck 12 noon and we can get started. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Veji Hibatuman. I'm the uh, interim ch uh, chair for the Deming Department of Medicine. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining today's grand rounds to be presented by Dr. Robert Handel, who is the uh, chief of the section of cardiology and the director of the Tulane Heart and Vascular Institute. He is also the Sydney W. and Marilyn S. Lassen Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine and the Professor of Medicine and Radiology at Tulane uh, University School of Medicine. Dr. Handel received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Biological Sciences from Northwestern University and his medical degree with distinction from George Washington University School of Medicine. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Northwestern University and went on to receive fellowship training in cardiovascular disease at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. After specialized training in nuclear cardiology, he returned to Northwestern University, where he remained for almost 10 years before he moved to Rush University Medical Center. While in Chicago, Dr. Handel also spent five years in a large single specialty practice before moving to Miami in 2010. At the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Dr. Handel served as the Director of Cardiac Imaging and Outpatient Services and Director of the Cardiac Care Unit, as well as the Interim Chief of the Cardiovascular Division. He was also the Associate Chief Medical Officer at the University of Miami Hospital. At the national level, Dr. Handel has served two terms on the Board of Trustees of the American College of Cardiology, representing more than 56,000 cardiovascular specialists. He has also been the president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and president of Cardiovascular Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine. He has served on multiple committees and received several key awards from these organizations. He's presently a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, fellow of the American Heart Association, and a master of the American Society of Nuc Nuclear Cardiology. Dr. Handel has delivered invited lectures lectureships at the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and a variety of other medical societies and institutions, as well as national conferences in more than 25 countries. He has also authored more than 200 papers and book chapters, published three of the leading textbooks in nuclear cardiology, serves on the editorial board for multiple journals. His areas of research interest have included angiogenesis, attenuation corrected SPECT imaging, patient risk stratification, and pharmacological stress testing, and quality and appropriateness in cardiac imaging. We are very pleased to have Dr. Handel to present today's grand rounds, which is on cardiovascular issues related to COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Handel. It's all yours now. Thank you, Dr. Bodeman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, but not for the reasons that I'm with everyone today, at least virtually. Uh, obviously, we've seen a dramatic change in things uh, over the last several months, and I wanted to highlight some of the aspects as they impact on the cardiovascular system. So uh, without further ado, I think everyone is very aware that COVID-19 has impacted us in great ways and certainly uh, is very involved in the cardiovascular system as we've been hearing virtually every day and every night. So what is the impact and where do we see these things coming uh, to be manifest? Well, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus clearly has respiratory aspects uh, involving the respiratory tree causing hypoxia. And it also is very uh, involved in the inflammatory response to the virus, which then causes subsequent injuries. But there's also direct myocardial injury. And through these separate pathways, we see COVID-19 manifest in a variety of ways that impact the cardiovascular system. We see biomarker elevation of injury, indicating that myonecrosis has occurred, cardiovascular arrhythmias, acute coronary syndromes, and then aspects which impact a heart function, both in diastolic and systolic abnormalities. Now, the question is, how prevalent is it? Uh, well, we see that, sir, first of all, COVID-19 does impact on patients that are either having existing cardiovascular disease or have significant risk factors. And as we can see from this slide, 
diabetes, hypertension, older age, and obesity, all of which are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, are highly prevalent in COVID-19 infections. These numbers here to the left impact the latest numbers that are released from a population of about 5,700 patients in New York and are probably the contemporary numbers. And as you can see, the overall prevalence of these factors in COVID-19 infections is very high. In addition to the high prevalence, we also see very high case fatality rates when the cardiovascular disease system is, uh, cardiovascular system is involved or risk factors are present, such as diabetes, hypertension, pre-existing cardiovascular disease, as well as obesity. And I think obesity deserves a special uh, recognition, unfortunately, because with COVID-19, we have seen very dismal outcomes in this population. Now, obesity is one of the cofactors that definitely impact on the immune system, and this is probably part of the reasons why this occurs. But if we look, a lot of the factors that impact on the immune function are very similar to those that are risk factors or cofactors in cardiovascular disease, such as age, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and again, obesity. But I would like to spend a minute or so on obesity because uh, this seems to be a real ringing uh, factor. Uh, it does cause immune deregulation, um, and it is pro-inflammatory, which may cause a lot of the sequela of what we see with this infection. It is clearly related to hypertension, diabetes, and coronary disease itself, which are all factors. It enhances thrombosis. Uh, more patients that are obese, infected with COVID, are on a mechanical ventilation. So all of these things give the, the question of whether or not obesity in and of itself is independent risk factor. Now, we still don't have those data, but certainly it is a cofactor and it is related to the cardiovascular system. Now, I do wanna highlight another very important aspect of the population that's being infected and their outcome, which is underrepresented in minorities. African-Americans are far more likely to contract the disease uh, we've seen data from Chicago and Michigan indicating marked prevalence of the disease in this population, such as in Chicago with more than 50% of the cases occurring in African Americans, although they constitute only 30% of the population. Perhaps even more concerning is the high case fatality rate. Some recent numbers from Louisiana indicate that it's probably 56%, uh, although that the population again is only 32%. I saw last night on television that once again, it's about double what other ethnicities and racial groups are exhibiting. So clearly what we see is an infection rate that's probably about three times more prevalent in underrepresented minorities and a morbidity, a mortality ratio that's really five to six fold what the uh, general population would be. Now, although this highlights the issue with African Americans, it's other groups, including Asian Americans and Hispanic populations that are also disproportionately impacted. So this really is a crisis. So you may ask why, is this genetic or is this some other factors? Well, I think the impact is clear. Clearly they have a higher health burden. We see a higher prevalence of diabetes, uh, hypertension, obesity, and cardiovascular disease in underrepresented minorities. And very often, these groups are in high density housing, very close proximity, and therefore there's an inability to practice social distancing. <coughs> often there's poor diet and nutrition, which also is another co confounder. Now, I think important to the COVID-19 infection is that we need essential workers. We need to have grocery store clerks and bus drivers and nurses and janitors. And many of these groups are indeed coming from the underrepresented minorities. And in addition to that, these people need to work. Uh, a lot of the, the individuals uh, that are in underrepresented minority groups really go from paycheck to paycheck. So they have to work. So therefore they're once again exposed. And I think another factor, probably not very significant in terms of COVID-19 infections, is access to medical care. But I think all of this together puts together the question of social determinants of health. And I think this is a very common strategy, but if you look at that, health is more than just the disease or the, or the genetic disposition, economic stability, the social context in the community, the neighborhood, the access to healthcare, and then healthcare literacy all help to form this. Now, I think this is a very important topic, uh, not, not going just to cardiovascular disease and COVID-19, but to all areas. But our, our own Keith Ferdinand said it very well very recently, just a few weeks ago, 
COVID-19 crisis must be seen as an opportunity to address cardiovascular disease risk disparities. So clearly this is something going beyond just the disease, but I would also add to uh, Dr. Ferdinand's editorial is never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, I think this is an opportunity to really look at these things very closely. And as a cardiologist, certainly cardiovascular disease and underrepresented minorities is something that we really do need to address. So what are the issues related to COVID-19 and the cardiovascular complications? Well, this slide I think illustrates the five major areas, acute coronary syndromes, myocarditis and cardiomyopathies or syndromes of left ventricular dysfunction, cardiac arrhythmias, heart failure, and thromboembolic disease. So we'll touch on each of these because I think they're really important. And as you'll see, this disease is really widespread when it hits the cardiovascular system. Usually, one of the manifestations is direct myocardial injury. Now, we could see this in a number of ways. We can see this as presented by EKG abnormalities, perhaps markers of uh, an injury such as elevated troponin or CKMB. And we can also assess by looking at LV dysfunction as a marker of myocardial injury. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of cofactors here. A lot of these patients are very, very ill. They may uh, have a septic uh, picture. They may have renal insufficiency. But no matter what, the presence of evidence of myocardial injury does portend a worse prognosis uh, in these individuals. This is from one of the first studies and first reports from Wuhan, China in March, uh, published in JAMA Cardiology, that demonstrates the association of cardiac injury with mortality in a large number of patients in Wuhan. And as you can see from the time of onset, um, those without cardiac injury did much better uh, in terms of survival than did have cardiac injury. And again, this was measured as troponin elevation. And the same thing is true uh, went from the time of admission. So there's a rather dramatic change in mortality rates just by looking at troponin elevations, as you can see here, possessing a hazard ratio of about four and a half times. So clearly, just the elevation of troponin is associated with worse outcomes. Now, what specifically are some of the characteristics that are associated with cardiac injury, again, manifest by troponin elevations? Well, certainly older age, and then the presence of a variety of cardiovascular risk factors that I've already mentioned, such as hypertension and diabetes, and then some of the manifestations of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, and then we see some biomarker elevation. So clearly, all of these things seem to be quite consistent. And it all comes down to what is the syndrome causing these cardiac injuries. So over, overall, we see COVID-19 is really demonstrating a number of different pathways that may promote cardiac injury, again, as manifest not only by troponin elevation, but also EKG changes and LV functional abnormalities. First, we see ACE2-mediated direct injury that may cause myocarditis. And we know the myocardium has an affinity towards the ACE2 receptor where it binds um, and causes its uh, havoc. And certainly the heart possesses many of these ACE2 uh, receptors. We also see problems with supply demand mismatch in COVID-19 infections, such as causing hypoxia uh, in the presence of poor ventilation and hypotension in the septic syndromes. And this can cause a supply demand mismatch causing type 2 myocardial infarction. We also see direct impact on the coronary artery itself, which can cause a usual type 1 myocardial infarction. And this may be due to endothelial dysfunction or plaque rupture, and very commonly now being associated with microthrombi in the coronary arteries, as we are now learning that COVID-19 has a procoagulant effect. And perhaps the most notorious is a systemic inflammatory response, which we're hearing about nowadays in children also, but this response may cause direct injury, probably due to cytokine, uh, cytokine storm and an uncontrolled inflammatory response. But it also may trigger catecholamine surges that may trigger stress cardiomyopathies, also known as Takasubo cardiomyopathy. So there are many different pathways to injury and result in uh, poor prognosis. Now, troponin elevation is present in up to 20% uh, of patients, and pre-existing cardiovascular disease does predispose that individual to this injury. And we see troponin elevations uh, more often in patients who require mechanical ventilation, who are at increased risk for ARDS, acute kidney injury, and coagulation disorders. And once the troponin elevation is present, 
It is associated with more arrhythmias. And as I've mentioned a few times, the mortality rate is markedly higher in marked troponin elevations than in the absence of any troponin elevation or cardiac injury biomarker. So what should we do about these troponin elevations? And as we're all aware, we're sampling troponins very frequently and we're detecting this in a very common fashion. So how should we approach this? And I'm gonna be a little controversial based on Jim Januzzi, who's a colleague of mine at the Mass General, because we're really not sure what to do. Um, so the recommendations may be due to the frequency of troponin elevation and the fact that it's very nonspecific, why should we even measure it? We need to deal with other aspects unless, of course, you suspect an acute myocardial infarction, in which case the course of action may be very different. Don't measure pro-BNPs or NT-pro-BNBs or BNPs because we're already looking at various aspects of respiratory syndromes and, and cardiac dysfunction. So again, perhaps not. Now, I would put a caveat here that's saying if you're truly trying to distinguish between ARDS and heart failure, it may be of some value, but we know in the setting of COVID infections, we see nonspecific specific elevation of BNP also. Now, for the most part, we don't recommend testing in isolated elevation of troponin or BNP because, again, there's really no impact on the outcomes or what we do for these patients. And that means that when a troponin elevation is present, we should not be ordering routine echocardiography. We're simply placing the sonographer in harm's way when we do this, because again, unless you really suspect heart failure in this instance or an acute MI, it is not usually of value. And then also when we see troponin elevation, usually the reflex is to start in aspirin and statins. And again, there's no clear benefit here. So I will wait for further evidence of uh, acute coronary syndromes. Now, this is a, uh, an EKG that we just saw about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Uh, very, very impressive in terms of its abnormalcy. It does demonstrate a wide complex QRS complex, but with marked and diffuse ST segment elevation, as you can see in multiple leads. Uh, this patient was rather uh, classic for a COVID infection, and he was definitely positive at the time. Uh, he did go to the cardiac catheterization laboratory because of concern about an acute myocardial infarction and he had normal coronary arteries, which again is very consistent with what we're seeing in the literature. So ST elevations, uh, again, a very, uh, it's a variable presentation. There's a high prevalence of non-obstructive disease, as I'll point out in a moment. So not just because you see elevation should it uh, trigger a cath uh, lab trip. And in fact, we probably should see reciprocal changes in other leads, but it is associated with poor prognosis. So why is this occurring? Well, this is probably occurring in the setting of direct cardiac injuries, such as myocarditis. Oops. Uh, this is from uh, an electron, micro uh, electron microscopy of a patient who did undergo endomyocardial biopsy in, uh, in China. Um, and I think it's really an amazing picture. First of all, we see our friend who we all know as uh, the COVID virus. Uh, and with its uh, spiked protein surrounding it, a very classic demonstration, sitting in the interstitium of myocardial tissue. So clearly there is impact and we are seeing this virus directly in myocardial tissue. So it's not surprising that there can be direct toxicity associated with this inclusion. Um, one of the first reports of myocarditis was presented again, uh, in this time in a study early uh, coming out of Italy, demonstrating again uh, ST elevation on the electrocardiogram, normal cardiac silhouette, but the cardiac MR studies are rather uh, descriptive of myocarditis. We see a diffuse enhanced signal on the cardiac MR indicating uh, edema of the tissues, which is also reflected in the T2 mapping sequence. And then in this final sequence, we see uh, late gadolinium enhancement surrounding a lot of the endocardial surfaces um, in this area. We also see a pericardial effusion. So clearly there's marked inflammation, edema, and perhaps even some early onset of fibrosis that's occurring. All of these are consistent with uh, myocarditis, and of course it can affect the pericardium also. So this was a case of acute myopericarditis. Now, obviously, if there's myocarditis, that may also lead to heart failure and shock. Uh, we are seeing a high incidence of heart failure in COVID-19 patients, up to 23%. And unfortunately, again, it's associated with a higher mortality rate. 
The other aspect of this that we're seeing is right ventricular involvement. I think this morning there was a publication of RV involvement in COVID-19, so it's now being reported with increased frequency. And again, this may be well due to a direct viral, in, a direct viral injury to the ACE2 receptor mediated uh, damage. Now we can also see this from ARDS and cardiogenic shock, so it's a little bit challenging uh, to distinguish, but as I mentioned earlier, perhaps in some cases the BNP or NT pro BNP is useful here. And I think when real questions arise, a limited echocardiogram at the bedside, preferably with a, a handheld device, can get, ascertain the overall status of the LV in terms of contractility. Now, what do we do with a real acute myocardial infarction? Uh, this is a patient who presented to the emergency department with chest pain. Um, and the question is now in the COVID era, how do we approach this? Um, probably several months ago, there would have been no question this would have mandated a trip directly to the cardiac catheterization laboratory and percutaneous coronary intervention. But now it raises a number of questions. Um, so what do we do? This is some of the guidance documents was released as a consensus statement, and I just wanted to highlight what we as cardiologists are thinking. If there's a COVID-19 infection that's felt to be possible, and the symptoms in EKG are consistent with a myocardial infarction, we should approach this in the same manner that we currently do or did before the COVID infections, which is primary percutaneous coronary intervention. However, when we are known to have a COVID infection or it's highly likely, perhaps then we have to consider performing an echocardiogram, at least a focused evaluation, perhaps with a handheld device. And if we see findings consistent with say a regional wall motion abnormality, proceed with PCI. If that's not clear, then perhaps additional investigation is warranted, but it has to be done in a timely fashion because we wanna provide PCI as quickly as possible. But obviously we're thinking about this, we have to be sure, and especially when they're uh, COVID positive and uh, appropriate uh, PPE must be uh, demonstrated, ideally in a negative pressure cath lab, which are very rare across the country. So what are we doing at Tulane? Well, this is the algorithm that we came up with that if a patient should present with a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and they're at low probability, then it's business as usual. With a moderate possibility, perhaps with some respiratory symptoms, then we wanna make sure that everyone is safely and adequately protected with PPEs, but then still proceed with primary PCIs. Now, when COVID is confirmed or it's a high probability, then we wanna make sure that the whole team has protective uh, gear. If not, or if we can't get the entire team in, perhaps there's illness or something, then nowadays we're going back to something we thought was uh, and we know is inferior, which is potentially thrombolytic therapy. Now, we have not had to do that yet in, a, in the New Orleans area, but it's certainly something to consider, and if we ever ran out of PPE, this would be the route to go. Now, non-STEMIs uh, without ST segment elevation really are being sort of attended to on a case-by-case -case basis. It does not mandate acute intervention unless the patient has a lot of other sequelae or is a high risk, but we certainly want to recognize the potential risk to staff by uh, taking that individual to the cath lab without a lot of preparation. Now, as I've mentioned, thrombolysis is an alternative. And at Tulane, we have sort of reactivated the concept of thrombolytic therapy. I won't go into this, but this is now an option. So should the attending cardiologist and fellow not be available, or we have problems in gaining PPEs, we do have the idea of using Retaplace as a thrombolytic agent um, and it's on uh, formulary and stocked as we need to. So it is an alternative approach. Now, overall, as I've mentioned, uh, there's a lot of reports of patients that are undergoing uh, treatment for STEMIs with COVID, um, but it's very interesting. 39% of them do not have the classic uh, occlusion or thrombosis or suspicion of a type one myocardial infarction, raising the question of myocarditis, endothelial dysfunction, Again, perhaps cytokine storm-induced damage. So there's a lot of issues here, and even the Italians had suggested maybe we should start using fibrinolysis in these individuals. Now, while this is going on, and, and everyone is very concerned about the presence of a COVID infection and getting a, a coronavirus illness, um, patients are missing. Uh, 
cardiac patients and stroke patients, and this is from the New York Times just a few weeks ago, suggesting that maybe patients aren't coming to the hospital with their STEMIs, because we have seen at all of our hospitals in the Tulane system a marked decrease in presentations with acute myocardial infarction. We're not alone. Um, this is from a publication just a few weeks ago indicating a rather dramatic drop in the New York City area uh, covering a, a large number of patients. I'm sorry, this is actually including a number of different institutions. And we can see a rather dramatic drop in STEMI activations, about 38% as I've alluded to. And the same number, about 40% has also been documented in Spain. So where are they going? Well, unfortunately, they're probably staying home, which is not necessarily a good thing because very little treatment can be provided. So we are seeing this downturn in presentations with acute myocardial infarction. Now, why? Well, the Gallup poll gives us some evidence. This is from a recent Gallup poll suggesting that people are very concerned or moderately concerned about getting medical attention. And that includes 68% of patients with known heart disease and almost all of patients who are having a risk factor such as hypertension. So this is clearly explained, I think, just by the fear of coming to a medical institution. Now, shifting gears away from acute coronary syndromes, uh, arrhythmias have also been well-documented, occurring in up to 44% of patients. These may be associated with palpitations. Um, and what types of arrhythmias are present? Well, the most common is sinus tachycardia, which is just related to the stress. But we've also seen SVTs, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. Now, why are these occurring? Well, Obviously, this is almost always associated with some myocardial injury, such as with myocarditis or an acute coronary syndrome, but can also be associated with the other manifestations of COVID-19 infections with metabolic derangements, hypoxia, neurohumeral changes, and yes, medication interactions, which can trigger arrhythmias. Excuse me. Now, unfortunately, the ultimate in uh, sequelae from an arrhythmia is sudden cardiac death. Um, so it raises the question of what do we do? Uh, this is a, a rather horrible situation, uh, one that I'm sure many of you have witnessed firsthand in our hospitals. Uh, but it raises some interesting questions. Uh, and I don't want to get into the ethics of this, but this is from a recent editorial, first do no harm. Now, when that statement's being used, we're almost always referring to our patients. But I think we also have to consider the clinicians and the population overall. So it raises the question and concerns, and again, I don't want to get into the morality of this, of you know, what if you do if you have a, a very critically ill patient who you think the prognosis is very poor? Do you then weigh that against the fact that this can potentially harm the staff? So clearly, this is something that we are thinking about. It may impact on our conduct of CPR um, and even whether or not it's given. But we've also learned that CPR now is being modified. There's a number of different adjustments that have been recently suggested that we should perform when CPR is administered to COVID-19 patients who are either confirmed or strongly suspected. First of all, we wanna reduce provider exposure. You should put on PPEs before entering the room. Now, obviously, maybe not the first person starting CPR, but we wanna do this as much as we can limit the number of people in the room, and then a, a growing number of people are using mechanical CPR devices to limit exposure to the staff. Uh, and we wanna to mention to anyone walking into the area in the room that the patient may be COVID positive. Now, what can we do to eliminate some of the risk? Well, we wanna prioritize oxygenation and ventilation, use filters for all ventilation, intubate early and connect directly to the ventilator, have a pause in the chest compressions, uh, chest compressions to intubate instead of just doing CPR during the intubation itself, and then try to minimize disruption of the closed circuit so that we don't have aerosolization of the virus itself. And as I mentioned earlier, and again, uh, beyond the scope of today's talk, is to consider resuscitation uh, efforts um, in, in the overall context of the patient's uh, survival potential. So moving on to another area, um, this was a highlight to the lay public, but I think many of us had already learned about the fact that something is going on with the coronavirus related to things beyond the lung and the heart, and that is the vasculature. What happened to this uh, Broadway star's leg? Why did he have it amputated? Well, obviously there was thromboembolic disease involved, and this has now become very commonplace. Uh, we've seen a great instance of this 
sorry. We, okay. So the thromboembolic issues were covered very, very well uh, by Cindy Lessinger just a few weeks ago. But just to review, because it does impact on the cardiovascular system, we should be concerned about this because many COVID patients have markedly elevated D-dimers, and this does correlate with the overall mortality of these patients. There's a high frequency of DIC present in patients that do not survive their infection. And we see these thromboembolic issues occurring not only in large vessels, such as for DVTs and PEs, but we're also seeing arterial events and small vessel and microvascular thrombosis, including in the coronaries and perhaps in the distal appendages like the toes we've heard. So what can we do? Uh, well, we certainly want to try to track this and, and, and identify it. Um, but we also want to, again, consider the healthcare worker. So just having D-dimer elevation, because it is so nonspecific, should not mandate imaging for VTEs because it may increase the risk. We want to look, however, when we are strongly suspicious of a pulmonary embolism, to look for right ventricular dysfunction. And we can do that in a very limited fashion with a focused uh, trans transthoracic echocardiogram. And we do want to do a CTs for PE detection when we have unsuspected oxygen desaturation. So not too much new there. This is from one of our patients that we saw, unfortunately, down here in panel C, we can see the marked uh, presence of what appears to be the classic manifestations of pulmonary involvement uh, with the coronavirus. But here we also see a huge saddle embolus that is present and obviously causing further problems in oxygenation and hemodynamic collapse. This is an echocardiogram from the same individual indicating a very dilated right ventricle and a D-shaped septum. And here we see the septal dysynergy uh, indicating right ventricular uh, decompensation in this individual. The presence of pulmonary embolism is exceedingly high. Uh, it appears to be greater than 20% as quoted from this one study in France. And interestingly, the majority of those patients were already receiving prophylactic anticoagulation. So that is really disturbing and has raised a lot of questions about what anticoagulation and, and how uh, high to dose the patient. And again, we've seen obesity as a comorbid factor uh, in, the, in these patients. So we really don't have much guidance yet. I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot more about it. How do we monitor anticoagulation? Is it with anti-10A monitoring? What dose do we use? Unfractionated heparin, uh, low molecular weight heparin, perhaps even the DOAX or NOAX, and then what dose? Uh, a lot of this is still unknown at the current time. The current recommendations by WHO are prophylactic low molecular weight heparin, um, and yet unfractionated heparin is usually considered preferable as it's an anti-inflammatory agent. Now we don't even know how long to treat, so we may start before we have the presence of thromboembolic phenomenon, and then we don't know how long to continue that. But again, I'm gonna emphasize the same thing today, which is the safety of the health, healthcare worker. Going in to do repeated anti-10A levels or adjustments uh, exposes the patients. So in many cases, people are considering sort of empiric therapies with DOAX or low molecular weight heparin. Now, does it impact on outcome? And again, this is from a very recent trial, uh, and I, I would suggest that we really don't know. Uh, overall, 28% of these almost 3,000 patients did receive anticoagulation. And interestingly, you see that overall, the patients that did receive anticoagulation in blue did better in terms of survival than those that did not get anticoagulation. And the ones that required mechanical ventilation received an even greater effect. Now, interestingly, the, none of this was statistically significant, which I found to be important because there's a lot of uh, co-founders in this study. It's observational. There was clearly a bias in who was getting anticoagulation and not. But I think the conclusions um, are interesting, that there does seem to be an association with anticoagulation and improved survival. And again, it suggests the real need for prospective randomized trials. So I'm sorry, I don't have the answers here, and I don't think anyone does in terms of exactly how to approach this dilemma. Now, the consensus recommendations are very interesting, and this were, these were released just about a month ago, um, and it suggests that moderate COVID infections without DIC consider prophylactic anticoagulation, but not necessarily therapeutic anticoagulation, and no screening was warranted. However, when DIC was present, then they recommended anticoagulation, 
but not therapeutic levels of anticoagulation, and then consider ultrasound. Now, I'm not sure these are right, and I've heard a lot of people criticize these as not being aggressive enough, um, but I wanna go back to uh, Cindy Lessinger's uh, advice, which she presented a few weeks ago, and that she's suggesting low molecular weight heparin appears to be superior to unfractionated heparin and is recommended for all of the COVID-19 hospitalized patients. Reserve full anticoagulation when there's objective evidence or strong suspicion for some thromboembolic event. And then we have to consider the longer term course that perhaps this is not done even after they're discharged and we may need to continue anticoagulation for an additional one to three weeks afterwards. So right now the verdict is not in, but certainly this is a grave concern for all of us. Now I'm gonna shift gears in how we also address a lot of our evaluation of patients because again, the healthcare worker is involved. So as a cardiac imager, I think that these suggestions are really important to think about. So if someone needs cardiac imaging, echocardiography, rated nuclide imaging, cardiac CT, MR, what, what is the pathway? Well, I think the key, the key here is in this box. Proceed with imaging only if it's likely to change the patient management. Well, that probably should be a watchword for almost anything we do, but I think in the setting of COVID-19, we really have to consider that. And then we have a number of things that we can implement, having a dedicated uh, room. We have to certainly have uh, appropriate PPEs and mask protection. We wanna make sure the equipment is clean and follow all of our guidelines as presented by our hospitals. So clearly things are a little different in the cardiac imaging domain, but I wanted to try to give you a little bit more information, and I think this is now uh, becoming pretty widespread, that we should defer elective and routine examinations at the current time. Now, perhaps time sensitive as we're becoming a little bit more open should be considered, but certainly routine things should still be postponed. We want to consider the fact that there's significant risk of infection for healthcare professionals and anyone who comes in, as well as contamination of the equipment and facilities for subsequent exposure to other patients. Even transportation of the patient as an inpatient uh, may expose uh, the patient and other healthcare workers. And if we do an imaging study, we want to decrease the duration of the study and minimize exposure to staff. So something like a stress echo, where the sonographer is directly next to the patient for a prolonged period of time, might not be a good idea at the current time, especially as we have alternatives. And we definitely should avoid exercise testing even now, because the idea of hyperventilating and droplet formation and spread is something that we definitely would like to avoid, uh, at least until the, the coast is clear. Um, there's no indication for echo or stress tests with a simple isolated elevation of troponin in the absence of ischemia. But when we do think that there's a concern about coronary artery disease or ischemia, we should consider the performance of SPEC, radionuclide imaging, or cardiac CT, or pharmacologic stress echo. Um, in the presence of dyspnea or edema, we can consider an evaluation, especially when the uh, BNP or pro NP, pro B, I'm sorry, NT pro BNP is elevated, and we can get a simple, isolated, focused study to assess left ventricular systolic function. We want to avoid TEs even as precardioversions because we can get similar information from a CT without exposure to the sonographer. So I think I've emphasized this that we really want to perform limited studies as much as we can. Now, finally, I want to discuss the impact of medications in the, in the COVID-19 era. Some of the treatments for COVID clearly might have impact on the cardiovascular system. Some of the antiviral agents may cause QT prolongation, heart block, direct cardiotoxicity with a cardiomyopathy, and altered lipid status. Uh, remdesivir, we really don't know too much in terms of the cardiovascular sequela, but it's obviously being looked at. And then our good friend hydroxychloroquine, clearly we know that there may be issues related to QT prolongation and potential lethal arrhythmias. There may be direct myocardial toxicity promoting car, um, dilated cardiomyopathies. But in addition to these direct impacts, there's also a lot of other interactions, which time won't permit me to get into, but I just wanted to highlight, even with anticoagulants and antiplatelets, there are certain agents that are much better 
to uh, be associated with, such as if you're using some of these antivirals, it appears that ticagrelor increases the antiplatelet effect and can cause excessive bleeding. So we might want to consider a different agent such as prasugrel. This is just an example of some of the drug-drug interactions that I think we have to be very cautious of in this era, especially with using some of these newer uh, therapeutic approaches for the treatment of the virus itself. Now, speaking of medications, there's been a lot of data regarding the renient angiotensin aldosterone system and COVID-19, largely because the ACE2 is the sort of point of action where the COVID and the uh, uh, spike protein binds, but it's also a factor in regarding uh, vasoconstriction. And one of our targets for therapeutics in hypertension, such as in using uh, angiotensin receptor blockers or uh, ACE inhibitors. So clearly, because the ACE2 uh, receptor is expressed in the heart, it raises a lot of concerns. And initially, there was a lot of concern, perhaps we should take people off of ACE inhibitors and ARBs because potentially they could cause harm. And then there was the concern on the other end that perhaps taking them off that medication may actually be harmful. So it was really in question for a long time, but I think that the overall scenarios now have been uh, really clarified. This now goes back a couple of months, but this joint recommendation uh, suggests continuation of RAS antagonists for those patients who are currently prescribed such agents for indications for which these agents are known to be beneficial, heart failure, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, but be advised not to add or remove any of these treatments beyond actions based on standard clinical practice. And I think we all have sort of taken this to heart, if you'll pardon the expression, and we have been followed this consensus guideline. We do now see some data. This is a very intriguing study just published a few weeks ago in Circulation Research involving 1,100 patients. About 188 were taking ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And overall, what it showed is very, very interesting that overall, there was a remarkable association with reduced all-cause mortality, as you can see from this slide here, uh, overall hazard ratio of 0.34, indicating that perhaps there was some benefit um, even after adjustment. And the conclusions of the paper is that it's unlikely that in-hospital use of an ACE or an ARB is associated with an increased mortality risk. So I think this clearly puts it to bed. Whether or not it's a therapeutic treatment for a COVID-19 patient is another story, but certainly they shouldn't be withheld. And this was recently reinforced by a, a large group uh, of studies that were sort of amalgamated from uh, Europe, Asia, and North America. Once again, in this forest plot, demonstrating that perhaps there's some benefit from ACE inhibitors and certainly a neutral effect from leaving ARBs. So I think, again, continue those medications if the patient has indications to be on them for, say, heart failure or hypertension. And I want to also mention our good friend hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I think everyone is probably very tired of hearing about this agent. The initial thoughts were concerns about the fact that it could prolong the QT interval, but there was very limited data, especially with azathioprine uh, uh, in combined use with the ZPAC. And there were some initial recommendations saying to monitor the QTC as well as serum electrolytes. Uh, the big concern here is that as we prolong this QT interval into this sort of danger zone here, what may result is something like this, which is torsade de point or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is indeed very often a lethal arrhythmia. So this has generated a lot of concern. Um, I think uh, courtesy of Dr. Marouche, uh, help to uh, promote some guidelines that should you be treating a patient with hydroxychloroquine that uh, has a, a potential COVID infection, we do want to monitor the QTC interval. And there's a variety of different aspects of how we go about doing this. Now, I don't want to go into details because I think overall this is really falling out of favor in general, but one of the intriguing ideas is to use mobile continuous telemetry so that the QT interval doesn't have to be measured electrocardiographically every day, um, and we don't need to have a telemetry unit to do this in order to, to scale this. But I think we've learned a lot more about this agent and its potential cardiotoxicity. Uh, this is from a recent trial, very often quoted. Uh, if you turn on the news, uh, you'll hear about it every night. This is one of the trials that was recently mentioned in 1,400 patients at 25 hospitals in New York receiving azithromycin plus hydroxychloroquine. And the conclusions are that there was no significant reduction of in-hospital mortality when receiving either of those drugs or in a combination thereof. 
Um, I, I do want to point out the curves here that the combination thereof is way up here, which is uh, showing a non-significant increase in in-hospital mortality. The one thing that was clear was that cardiac arrest was more common with an odds ratio of more than two if the patient was receiving both drugs. Now, there's a lot of confounders in this study. This is uh, not necessarily the end-all and be-all study as published in JAMA, but certainly it is very alarming and very concerning and is consistent with most of the scientific data raising caution about the use of hydroxychloroquine. We've seen a number of headlines. This was going back uh, about a month and a half ago uh, after the initial release of the VA study, uh, suggesting that uh, maybe it shouldn't be used um, and there's a high risk. There was consensus documents that were recommending against the combination because of the toxicities. And then finally, the FDA warning, which cautions against the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine um, outside of the hospital setting uh, due to the risk of heart rhythm problems. So clearly, if it's gonna be used, we have to watch this very carefully. Now, I wanna conclude my presentation with just a brief uh, review of healthcare workers. Uh, and again, I know this is my focus, but I think this is really important to consider. We do wanna limit person-to-person -person visits whenever possible. We at Tulane have seen a tremendous growth in telehealth, which I think is uh, very intriguing in general, but also very, very helpful for our staff that may come in contact with potentially infectious and um, uh, contagious uh, people. Electrophysiology, uh, well, we don't need to do as many serial EKGs and consider the use of monitoring. And some of these devices can be done so that uh, they, they can be monitored for a prolonged period of time using remote uh, devices. We're even checking pacemakers and ICDs remotely, and we can defer them as long as the battery life is okay. So again, reduce the contact to healthcare workers. Invasive laboratories such as EP and uh, interventional cardiology, uh, again, these are non-aerosolizing procedures, but they have a risk of sudden death and therefore intubation and CPR. Ideally, these labs should be negative pressure, but unfortunately, most of the country does not have that uh, capability. We want to avoid procedures, if possible, that could result in cardiac arrest, and we've already discussed a little bit about CPR modifications, um, and defer elective procedures whenever possible. Now, again, time sensitive, we should do them. Purely elective, we're not quite there yet. And then even non-invasive testing. Please keep in mind, it must impact on the care of that individual. So we want to do something called POCUS in our inpatients or point of care echoes, and hopefully perhaps due to some philanthropy that we're pursuing, we can get these handheld devices which are much easier to clean and can give us enough information without the use of a, a, a large machine moving from room to room. TEs or transesophageal echoes must be done selectively with care and protection for all workers. Avoidance of stress echoes, again, due to the proximity of the sonographers, and consideration of pharmacologic stress testing instead of exercise testing to reduce droplet formation and spread. And likewise, we can use cardiac CT in lieu of many of these stress modalities. Well, we're reopening. We've all heard this, and here uh, within the Tulane Health System and our affiliated hospitals, things are starting to move towards normal. They're near normal, not quite there. So we wanna continue social distancing and PPE and cleaning is intensified. Again, time sensitive testing is the key. Outpatient clinics, we're, started, we're using telehealth, but we're now starting to see key patients. I saw one today that had a telephone visit yesterday that was very concerning. So he was brought in because it clearly was gonna impact on his care. Non-invasive testing, we're still doing limited volumes on only those that are really felt to be necessary and using PPEs when appropriate. And then we have a variety of different testing procedures that vary between the VA, University Medical Center, and Tulane Medical Center, but basically are all suggesting that we plan ahead, do testing ahead of time, five to seven days, for presence of an active infection, and then also on the day. And then, especially when there's a high-risk procedure, such as TEE or intubated patients, we want to make sure everyone has uh, good protection. So in, uh, in summary, I think there's high-risk patients, high-risk populations clearly have a higher likelihood of COVID-19 infections. And unfortunately, that's associated with worse outcomes. Myocardial injury is common and associated with a worse outcome when it's present. But we've seen a huge and wide spectrum of cardiovascular involvement. This involves an acute coronary syndrome, 
acute myocardial injury without obstructive disease, as shown by a number of different processes, cardiac arrhythmias, heart failure, and even cardiogenic shock, effusions with the possibility of cardiac tamponade and thromboembolic uh, complications. And then finally, medication considerations. We need to consider the drugs, not only in direct uh, impact on the patient, but also drug-drug interactions that may occur. And finally, to consider the protection of our healthcare workers. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Handel. Uh, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, there is uh, one uh, by Dr. Evan At Atkinson. Uh, he is asking, are there data to su suggest adipose tissue might provide an attractive nidus for entry replication of coronavirus? I had come across uh, some literature in mice regarding ACE receptors on adipocytes, but I have not seen data on this in humans. Uh, I haven't seen the, those data either, but clearly there is an association with obesity and not only the incidence of the infection itself, but also the outcomes of what COVID-19 does. So there is some sort of modulation. And I think increasing data is supporting the idea that this is an independent factor. So there is something, I mean, there, we have learned a lot about uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but we still don't know very much. So I'll defer to virologists on that one, but I, I think clearly there is a clinical association between increased uh, adiposity and uh, worse outcomes. Okay, question from uh, Facebook by Media Gabriel uh, asking, has pulmonary embolism been seen in patients who have recovered from COVID-19? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, you know, we have seen some that have left the ICUs that have gone on to develop a thromboembolic phenomenon with DVTs that were not, not detected and then may have had a PE. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why Dr. Lessinger and others are recommending that patients with a significant risk for thromboembolic disease and COVID um, should be anticoagulated for a prolonged period of time, one to three weeks. Now, that being said, I think most survivors of this infection are pretty dis disabled and may not be uh, as ambulatory. So certainly we need to consider some sort of therapeutic to prevent further formation. But uh, I think it's definitely a risk. And I think pretty much every clinician that has been in a ICU recently has, has been impressed by the formation of PEs and DVTs with this, with this virus. Can these patients be tracked by the dimer levels? Well, yes and no. Um, the D-dimer is very nonspecific, and I think low levels do not necessarily indicate a high risk for thromboembolic disease because, again, it's a marker of uh, the virus itself, perhaps. But I think very high levels, and people have pointed to levels of 1.5 or 2 as being the cutoff to start to think about uh, anticoagulant uh, uh, administration. And again, we're still learning on this. I, I personally believe that very high levels of D-dimers certainly at the very least should be uh, administered prophylactic uh, low molecular heparin or unfractionated heparin. Um, and I'm also starting to lean towards more therapeutic doses in those patients uh, because we've just seen such a, a large number of these events. Now, that being said, we also have to be concerned about the hemorrhagic complications. And Dr. Lasky has pointed out a number of times that these patients are very prone to pulmonary hemorrhage also. So it, it's really a double-edged sword. Okay, thank you. Dr. Doug Rivera is asking, might there be a decreased mortality in COVID patients taking low-dose aspirin or other antiplatelet drugs on admission? Not that it's been analyzed. The, the question is a good one. Um, again, a, a lot of the myocardial injury is not the classic acute coronary syndrome with occlusion or, or severe stenosis of a coronary artery. And again, even what we think sometimes are, are ST segment elevation MIs, almost 40% of them are not. So we haven't really seen that, and we certainly don't know whether there's any benefit of taking an antiplatelet agent uh, ahead of time. Uh, again, the bleeding risks may be significant in this population, but we really don't know. And I, and I don't know too many centers at this point I haven't heard that are advocating for, say, uh, administration of an aspirin on presentation. A question from Dr. Mushat, which is related to this uh, he comments, uh, there's a treatment protocol at another out-of-state academic center recommending 81 milligram of aspirin in addition to 
low molecular weight heparin. Thoughts? Uh, similar question. Um, you know, I don't know whether we really have any data. Certainly, uh, you know, we're, we're all stri striving to see peer-reviewed data in some sort of controlled fashion, um, even for the common medications that we hear about every day. Um, I don't know of any controlled trials whatsoever that are actually looking at this. Um, you know, is there a harm to 81 milligrams of aspirin? Probably not. Um, whenever we suspect an acute coronary syndrome, that is something we do. So I think if a patient presents, let's say, with symptoms of chest discomfort or an EKG that's um, clearly associated with ischemia, it's something to consider. But remember, a lot of our patients that may have troponin elevation or even EKG findings consistent with ischemia may be having a demand uh, imbalance, a supply-demand imbalance, and a type 2 infarct, in which case I'm not sure that aspirin is effective. So I, I don't think we have any data, and um, I'm not sure that I personally would pursue that. Okay, there's a question from Dr. Uh, Jaime Palomino. Are we already seeing the complications in patients not seeking acute medical care regarding acute coronary syndromes or other cardiac pathologies? Oh, I think the answer is yes. And I think even here in New Orleans, we're seeing a tremendous downturn in our STEMI activations at all of our hospitals. Uh, you know, people are staying home. Now, whether we start to have uh, a lot more at-home deaths and autopsies start revealing that people are having acute MIs at home or an increased incidence of heart failure or admissions of cardiogenic shock, that would clearly support it. I think that's going to require a lot of uh, analysis, but we already know just, just counting the numbers of people that present with stroke, acute strokes or acute myocardial infarctions, pretty much it's ubiquitous. The numbers are way down in, in every area. A question from uh, Dr. Hua Lu. Uh, is there any study to distinguish the coincidence of cardiac disease uh, with coronavirus infection from the cause of uh, CM, uh, I'm not sure what he's uh, meaning with that, by the virus. Uh, not sure what that means. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, well, we have a few more minutes. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Dr. Hualu uh, clarifies uh, cardiac disease. Uh, could you just repeat the question then, please? Dr. Bottom, could you repeat yes. the question? Uh, is there any study to distinguish the coincidence of cardiac disease with coronavirus infection from the cause of cardiac uh, disease by the virus? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's, we do know, you know, and I think it's very interesting that, you know, the endomyocardial biopsy that I showed earlier clearly showed that it was in the interstitial area. So we do know that it is getting into the myocardial tissue, and there's a lot of evidence, somewhat circumstantial, that there's direct toxicity of the virus and, it, and its attachment to the ACE2 receptor. Um, whether there's other aspects, and again, we know that the inflammatory response itself and probably the cytokine storm is also impacting on the cardiovascular system. So I, I don't know whether we have the chicken or the egg and whether we can isolate one from the other because I think it's going together into sort of a perfect storm in terms of cardiovascular complications. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lu, thanks. Uh, and uh, thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Handel, for this uh, very intriguing and uh, interesting uh, presentation. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, goodbye.